it is time to get into our investigation. What I've done is created a murder board sort of thing in PowerPoint. We are investigating the death of Beth Ferris Hendricks. Her, the police, <clears throat> the police claim or say that she probably jumped or fell off of a cliff, wound up drowning and washed up on the beach. Her sister Gwen tells us that that cannot be the case because Beth was deathly afraid of heights. So there's no way that she went up to the top of Ballantine's Bluff, I think it's called, uh, and fell or jumped. What we know about Beth is that she's married to Joey Hendricks. She has a daughter named Ruby. Gwen, obviously, is her sister. She has started her own accounting firm, and she was on the town council. And we know those things uh, because that information is provided in some of the documentation that we're given. And we will get into that. We were given objectives in, in this mystery for this chapter one. Our first objective was to look at all the documents and items for clues, check the virtual desktop for additional evidence, and we did find some there, decipher all of the coded messages, and begin profiles on any potential suspects. So we've done those things. We, we started making a list, <clears throat> and as I progress through this investigation, you'll see what conclusions I've come to and who I am very suspicious of. We're going to start this out, though, looking at two of the letters that were in the box. And we've already read this Gray investigation letter. It's just letting us know that that Michelle Gray, um, who's a, a private investigator in Chicago, had forwarded either forwarded Gwen to us or us to Gwen or both. And we also know that she's told us that she set up the virtual desktop so that we would have an easier time transferring information and files between Gwen and ourselves and probably Michelle could pop in and look at it if she wanted to. Um, I kind of look at this virtual desktop as being like a Google Docs or like a Dropbox kind of a thing. Um, so if we get into... Michelle's letter, detective, first things first, thank you for taking my case. Michelle says, you're the best there is, and I'm up against a lot here. Six weeks ago, my sister's body washed up on North Beach. She had a huge gash in her head, so the cops think she fell from a nearby cliff and floated in on the tide. They ruled her death an accident. I believe them, but Beth was scared of heights, and I mean absolutely terrified. My gut tells me there's no way she fell from anything taller than a step stool. My sister was murdered. She wasn't perfect, but I thought everyone loved Beth. I guess it's possible her work could have something to do with it, although I'm not sure how. She was a pretty successful accountant, even served on the town council. She's a typical overachiever. It's an awful feeling to think that someone wanted her dead. Her personal life was a little messy. She was married to this loser from high school, Joey, and I don't think it was going well. She wouldn't give me a ton of specifics. Actually, the last time I saw her, it seemed like something was wrong. The day of her murder, we met at the hotel I run to walk the to talk about our mom. Mom's not well, and it's really hard taking care of her. To start with, Beth was late, and then as much as I tried to get Beth to focus, she was somewhere else. And then she just had to go. I was going to call her later that night to check in, but there was a pool emergency at the hotel. Time got away from me, and I never called. If she would have just talked to me, we could have figured something out, whatever it was. <clears throat> Michelle told me to send you everything I could get my hands on. There's some paperwork from the cops. I'm trying to get more, plus a few things from Beth's funeral. The program I'm sending you belonged to Reverend Reaver. He tried to weasel his way out of doing a service to attend a so-called spiritual retreat. The Bible verses he wrote down don't match up, so give it a look. I'm also sending... <clears throat> some stuff to help you learn more about Mallory Rock and the people here. Forget what the brochure says. Locals here don't like summer people. Everyone here is just a little bit off. Like the previous owner of my hotel. Excuse me. 
who you can thank for that dry erase marker. We got a dry erase marker in our box. The genius ordered 10,000 of them as fun souvenirs. Most of them are still sitting in the stock room. Oops, ah, too high. Honestly, I'll never know what Beth saw in this miserable island, but for whatever reason, she loved it here. The coaster belonged to her. We also got a coaster in the box. One of my many pieces of Mallory Rock swag. On, one of the many pieces of Mallory Rock swag on her desk. She, <clears throat> she made me a place. She made me a playful list a few months ago, so I added to the virtual desktop. We also got a, a song list, a Spotify playlist. She told me to listen to it when I needed to clear my head, when I needed to feel at home. Now, the first thing we should do is to figure out where Beth died, because I wa because I know it wasn't there on the bluff. Do you think her body could have gone in the water somewhere else? If you can figure out another location, I'll see there's a way to prove it. Once you have an answer, use the contact page on Michelle's desktop to send me a message with the subject matter of the island. So... That is what Gwen wanted us to do, um, which is easy enough. She just wants us to figure out where Beth was murdered. Although I'm not sure where Beth was murdered and where Beth was put into the water are the same thing. But for now, we'll go with it. So then Gwen said there's a police report and she sends us a copy of the police report. So, up ah, too far. So, Mallory Rock Police Department, Sergeant Alex Castillo. The location of the incident was the North Beach of Mallory Rock, Maine. Nature of incident, incident accidental death. There were no witnesses. Uh, one victim, fatal, Elizabeth Ferris Hendricks. She died. Uh, she was born September 17th, 1984. This is her home address. I don't know if it plays into anything now, but at least we have it if we need it for the future. It says Ms. Ferris Hendricks' body was discovered on North Beach. However, she was married, so I don't know why they said mi they didn't say Mrs. I don't know if that's a typo or if that's something that we're going to need to look back into later but we'll take a look at that when we need to. Anyhow, uh, discovered on North Beach, adjacent to Ballantine's Bluff. Ballantine, Ballantine. I'm going to say Ballantine, but it could be Ballantine's Bluff. The body was found by Ingrid and Maeve Sloan, two out-of-town visitors who were boating in the area. They immediately came ashore and called MRPD. Sergeant Alex Castillo, Alex Castillo was the first to arrive on the scene, followed by Sergeant Sullivan Combs. The body exhibited severe trauma to the back of the head as well as minor injuries throughout. Ms. Ferrix Hendricks family members <clears throat> have given statements for the purposes of the investigation. There were no direct eyewitnesses to the accident as the area is fairly remote. And we will get to these notes that are in here when we're done looking at the overall report. The <clears throat> this is the conclusion. The location of Ms. Ferris Hendricks' body and the nature of her injuries are identical to three cases of accidental death that occurred at Ballantine's Bluff, Ballantine's, okay, Ballantine, I'll say Ballantine, Ballantine's Bluff in 2004, 2006, and 2017. Based on these similarities and the absence of any evidence of foul play, it is the investigation's finding that Ms. Ferris Hendricks slipped and fell from the top of the bluff Sustaining injuries during the fall, she drowned after being submerged while unconscious. Miss Ferrix Hendricks' body floated in shallow water before it washed up on North Beach. It is unknown why Miss Ferris Hendricks was at the bluff at the time of the accident. Findings have been communicated to the family for medical examiner's findings, CME report. So that is what the police say. They just pretty much said, oh, she fell. Same as three other people. Um, so I don't think that's suspicious. I don't think the other three drownings are sus should be, would be looked at as being suspicious. Let me say that. Um, it's an island that's sort of a resort, a touristy spot. And I don't think, um, in almost 20 years or whatever, was it 20 years? What was 2004? So in 17 years, I don't think it's odd that 
now four people have wound up drowning on the island. I, I, I live close to Lake Erie, and every summer there's three, four people that wound up wind wind up drowning over the course of the summer. So that's not suspicious. So I can see why they would be like, ah, uh, it's just another death. Um, the injuries are a little suspicious, but like the police are saying, she fell off a cliff, possibly hit her head on the way down, um, was knocked unconscious, and that's how she drowned. And, and I could see that. No witnesses or anything to go off of. Um, so here is what Gwen now she circled on North Beach. I don't know why that was suspicious to Gwen. I mean, that is where she was found. So family members, maybe she circled that. Well, let's, or maybe the circle just goes with where did she go into the water? Not Valentine's Bluff. So she did land on North Beach, but Gwen doesn't believe she went in at Valentine's Bluff. Miss Ferris Hendricks' family members have given statements. Need to know where Joey was. What is his alibi? Joey is Beth's husband. So Gwen is already like, okay, did Joey do it? Because that's the first thing you jump to in a, a death of a a female, the husband, the wife, or the wife, the husband, the boyfriend. I get that. Um, findings have been commuted, communicated to the family for medical examiner's findings. See Emmy report. Don't have this yet. Text Sully. So Sully, we're going to assume, for the sake of this, is going to be... Where was that? Where did it say? Where did it tell us? somewhere oh it's in the text so sully um must be sergeant sullivan combs that's my guess because of course sully is a nickname for S sullivan um so right now we know that gwen does not believe that beth went into the water at Ballantine's bluff because of its height she does suspect that possibly Joey was involved because there was marital drama. Um, and she wants to see family member statements or is questioning family member statements because she doesn't know where Joey was at the time. And then she's also suspicious because it's been six weeks and she hasn't seen an ME report. Uh, and so I get that. You know, you, you think your family member died. Uh, the police are saying, you think your family member was murdered. The police are saying, no, all the evidence points to an accident. And they're sort of right. Other than Hor other than Gwen's hunch that Beth was afraid of heights and would not have gone up onto Ballantine's Bluff, there's no reason to believe that she was murdered. And you actually don't know, you know, maybe... She was afraid of heights, but maybe she decided that was the best way to kill herself because she was having issues. Um, we just don't know. So then we had we were given um, an email conversation. Actually, before that, let's jump to. Uh, This is our virtual dashboard. And here we have some files and stuff that we're going to look at. One of them is screenshots of a conversation that Gwen had with Sully. Um, she better plug her phone in. So, hey, do you have a second to chat? I just got on break. What's up? Another mainland influencer skip out on their bill? And then Gwen says, I know this sounds crazy, but... I'm working with a private and guest investigator to get my sister's case reopened. We've got some paperwork from MRPD, Mallory Rock Police Department, but we need more. 
They told me it can take a long time. Any chance you can help me get stuff any faster, like as a personal favor? Crickets. You there? I don't think I can. I know that's hard to hear. I'm really sorry. Okay, Sully. Thanks for the help. I'm not asking you to rob a bank or something. I just need more evidence. Stuff like her autopsy. It's taking forever. Sully, I can't go around passing out files behind the chief's back. If I want to keep my job, I'm sure they'll give you everything as soon as they can. I hope you can understand. I thought I meant something to you. Oh. Hmm. Interesting. You know that's not fair. It was your decision, remember? And then Sully's like, break's over. I'm sorry, Gwenny. And that's the end of the conversation. So that's interesting. Looks like Sully and Gwen had a thing, and Gwen's like, hey. And it appears also that Gwen broke it off with Sully. So Gwen's like, hey, can you do me a favor? And Sully's like, no, sorry. <laughs> That's on you. Which I don't know. I don't know. Um, this is the only mention at all that we have in any of the documents we were given of the chief. So I don't know if that's important later. I don't know if information is not forthcoming because somebody in the town is holding it back. I don't know if it's just bureaucratic process and it's coming, but it's taking forever. Um, so all this tells us is that Gwen asked her boyfriend, uh, ex-boyfriend, police officer friend to help her out. And he was pretty much like, nope, that's on you. Sorry. But then he called her Gwenny, so maybe he really is sorry. Maybe he really is afraid for his job, or maybe he is in on the gig, whatever that is. So I just thought that was interesting. Um, so then we find Sully not at all helpful. Then we get to an email exchange. What are we doing here? Hold on. We get to an email exchange between Gwen... And um, Beth's in-laws. So this is an email exchange between Gwen and Jody Hendricks and Martin Hendricks. And Jody are Martin. Jody and Martin are Sister Beth's mother and father-in-law. And so Gwen starts out, "Hey, I've been trying to reach Joey and can't get a hold of him. Is everything okay?" having a really tough time getting Beth's case reopened. I need to talk to him about that day. So she's still trying to figure out what his story was for that day. To which Gwen gets a reply. You know I'd do anything for Beth. Let me know what you need. M. So that's Martin. P.S. What's going on with the pool leak situation? Any more problems with the pump? Also, how's your mom doing? So Martin is, is being generally, genuinely, or I shouldn't say genuinely. Martin is being friendly. Um, we know that there was a pool leak the day of Beth's murder because it said so in our letter. We also know that her mom isn't doing well. Um, and Martin's asking about it. And so Gwen then says, hi, Martin. Can I come over Wednesday night? The pump's fine. Thanks. Mom's good. She remembered Ruby's name yesterday and asked about her. And then Wednesday with a question mark. So Ruby is Beth's daughter. Um, and apparently mom must have dementia or Alzheimer's or something um, if she's struggling to remember names and stuff like that. Um, so then Gwen gets this. Hi, Gwen. Oh, whoa, went too far. Hi, Gwen. Sorry if this comes out of nowhere, but when Marty emailed you, we hadn't had a chance to talk about this as a family. You really shouldn't come over. As you know, we both loved Beth very much. However, as much as we miss her, Sometimes the only thing to do is remember that everything happens for a reason. Have you thought on how opening a new investigation will affect Ruby? You know how close she and Marty are. And while he won't tell you this himself, he's very worried about her. We know you mean well, but she's been through a lot. We will hold sweet Beth in our hearts forever. This is from Jody. So it appears that Jody, mother-in-law, doesn't want to be anywhere near a new investigation and is using the name of the daughter Ruby to chase Gwen off of stirring up some stuff. 
Um, so then Gwen emails back to Jody, don't use Ruby as an excuse. If you don't want to help, just say it. Gwen, my answer was written with love for you and concern for my granddaughter. I'm sorry you took it otherwise, Jody. So then Gwen says, if you care so much about Ruby, why not ask her what she thinks? And then Gwen says, well, Gwen, we will not be all of it. We will not be involving her in this. Please try to be reasonable. And then Gwen is like, okay, I'm done. Tell your useless son to call me. I think we should all take, and then Jody says, I think we should all, or this is Martin, sorry. I think we should all take a step back and let things cool down. I'll talk to Joey. All the best, M. So that's the end of that email chain. And I think it's interesting, on the surface, it appears that Martin is all about trying to help and that Jody, the wife, is not about that life. She she doesn't want anything to do with the investigation. So I find that a little suspicious. Why why don't you want to help? Um You know, is she covering for her son Joey? Does she know that Joey did something and she doesn't want that to get out. Um, you know, we just don't know right now. I just think it's very suspicious. Two people don't want to help now. Sully doesn't want to help. And Jody doesn't want to help and has apparently talked Martin into going along with that plan. So that's sort of interesting. Um, another interesting piece of evidence that we got was, let me go back to the regular size. The Lantern Magazine came in our, um, came in our box. And it's just a local magazine. I don't know if, instead of a local paper, they put out this magazine in lieu of a, a weekly paper, or if it's a monthly thing that just highlights the community. But it's the Lantern. Um, and it talks about some things. It talks about the Lighthouse Festival. It talks about, it gives horoscopes. This is the back cover. Uh, this is the contents. There are a couple of things in here that I find extremely interesting. And I'm going to address them right now. Um. And the first one is this article about Jordan Woodard. And I'm trying to blow it up so that my horrible eyes can read it. That's better. So Jordan Woodard. This issue's hometown hero is property whiz and entrepreneur Jordan Woodard. We sat down for a Q&A with Jordan to hear about his latest ventures on Mallory Rock. Um... TL, The Lantern, your company, JW Enterprises, has really revitalized the housing industry here on the island. What would you say is the greatest contributor to your success? First of all, let me just say that it's really difficult starting from the ground up in real estate. I'm pretty much 100% self-made, despite what people might believe, and I've worked for everything I have. True story. So I would say that the number one key, especially if you're like me and nobody ever gave you anything, is belief, meaning you have to believe in yourself 100%. If you can't do that, everything else will fall. If you can do that, everything else will fall into place. I guess some people would use other another word, confidence. So he's confident apparently. The lantern. Any other tips for people looking to start their own business? JW Taxes are for suckers. I'm dead serious on that. That's an interesting statement that I'm going to get back to. Um, the Lantern. Did you always know you wanted to go into real estate? Have you ever tried any other careers? J, uh, JW. I pitched for the Mallory Rock Mariners back in high school, and that got me a baseball scholarship at Portland Maritime. Fun fact, 30% of all pitchers are lefties, and so am I. I think that's probably why I am so successful. I was I was recru ugh. I was recruited for a few minor league teams, but before graduate 
right before graduation, but I turned them all down. It was the right thing to do. This sounds harsh, but there's no money in that. Okay, so he's left-handed. JW Enterprises has had a lot of success flipping houses on the island, but you've recently started investing in the local restaurant scene. Can you tell us about any new projects? And then JW says, I recently acquired partial ownership of Louis Lobster Pound, which has been around for a long time but was kind of fading. Everyone says the place has done a 180 with my help. I also just bought a fun little bar called The Rock Lounge. It's a great place to unwind, but not super family friendly, just FYI. And then the lantern asks any the lantern asks any final words of wisdom. And Mr. Woodard says, if you're looking to buy on Mallory Rock, give me a call. So I read that and I was kind of like, this guy's a dick. Like he's super conceited. He's saying confident, but he's arrogant. He he's like, oh, I, I it's hard to do, but I did it. He's like, I was too good to go play minor league baseball. Um, he's like. Then he's talking about getting involved in local businesses. He's like, I bought a bar and everyone has said it's done a 180 since I got involved. I just think he comes off as extremely arrogant. And so I noted him down. Um, he mentioned tax evasion. And we know that our girl is an accountant. So I'm starting to formulate maybe she was knocked off because... She figured out he was doing something wrong as far as taxes go. I don't know. I'm just I'm just throwing stuff out there, um, trying to form a picture. Um, and then the other thing that we'd like to look at here is uh, oh, this is what the um, the minister looks like, or the pastor. So this is the pastor of the church. This is the guy that did not want to do the memorial service. Um. Wait, I want to see something. I want to see. What is September? Beth was September 17th, was it? I think it was September 17th. So she was a Virgo. Now is the time to reach out to loved ones. Reconnect with an estranged family member or forgotten friend. And you might find a once distant relationship is worth rekindling. Nah, that doesn't tell me anything. I just thought maybe they were put in here for a reason. I don't even know how to pronounce that, but technically that's what I am. November 25th. Um, Ophuchus? 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 Ophuchus is rarely used or referenced in modern horoscopes, but it has been called the 13th zodiac sign due to the constellation's ecliptic path. Here's a bonus horoscope for any reader who considers themselves Ophuchus. Be wary of false promises and flatterers. Not all that glitters is gold. Okay, great horoscope. Doesn't mean anything. Isn't for the story. Just thought I'd check it out. So... Let's get to the Navigators Club. The Navigators Club, and I'm not really going to read this. This just talks about how um, it was formed to preserve, to preserve lore and local history. Um, it lists the founding family members. So all these members, all these people still live on the island. And you'll hear us talk about Hendrix. Reaver is the pastor's last name. Gundy, Ferris, so our two girls, Beth and Gwen, are Ferris's. Good, Woodard, the jerk I don't like, and Ballantyne. Um, you have to be a male member of the family to join the Nav Navigators Club. Um, so, as the twentieth century reared the, as the twenty, ugh, as the twentieth century neared. The descendants of the founders of Mallory Rock began to worry their ancestors' legacy was fading. Hoping to keep the 
Founders' Memory Alive, the Hendricks, Reaver, Gundy, Ferris, Good, Woodard, and Ballantyne families came together to form a new organization on the island. On the island, the club, the club would have one primary purpose: to honor their forebearers' contributions to Mallory Rock. After the charter was signed in 1890, so this is an old club. The Navigators Club began meeting in the home of one of the founders, Edwin Good. However, since every male descendant of Mallory's crew was eligible to join the club, to join the club soon outgrew the residential space. In need of a separate building, the members quickly settled on a location on Anchor Street, and construction began in 1892. The architect chosen for the project, Philip Breck, was well versed in the Gothic Revival style and had previously designed several well-known buildings on college campuses throughout New England. Okay, that is the first clue to this being a secret society. Um, and I will explain why in a second, but, and I don't, I'm trying to figure out how to, um, so when I say secret society, I mean something like, uh, the Masons. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they are some sort of a, like the Masons, um, at Yale university, some members are allowed into a secret society. Some students there are allowed into a secret society called the Skull and Bones. Um, that kind of a secret society. Like it's, people know it exists, but their meetings are secret. Their traditions are secret. Like nobody's allowed in the clubhouse. That kind of a thing. Still in pristine condition today, the Navigators Club Meeting House is a prime example of the Gothic Revival style. While visitors are not allowed to enter the meeting house itself due to the club's privacy concerns they are welcome to admire its exterior the surrounding green space known as sailors memorial park is modeled after an english garden and provided provides a place of rest and recreation recently members of the navigators club completed a large-scale campaign to renovate the grounds the most notable change was the addition of a large sundial a nod to the club's nautical origins with proactive improvements like these, the, architect the architectural treasure is sure to retain its historic beauty for the next generation of Islanders. So, once again, Navigators Club is just a suspicious, and I say suspicious just because they're a secret society. I don't think the Freemasons are suspicious. I don't care what what movies like, the, like National Treasure say. I mean, sure, they have secrets, um, but I don't think that Historic documents lead you on a treasure hunt kind of stuff. Another important thing. And this is really important to the investigation, it turns out. So, there was a kayak recovered. When visitors from Burley, Massachusetts, Sandra and Ken Schultz, lost their sea kayak in a rip current, they were prepared to resign themselves to Mother Nature's will. Little did they know the wonder of the internet would reunite them with their long-lost treasure. Local radio DJ Edward Gundy, better known to his many fans as Eddie Blue, was walking along North Beach with his daughter Samantha when he spotted the brightly, col brightly colored vessel coming in on the tide. I knew it had to be lost, Eddie said, but I wasn't sure how to get it back to the right person. Saman Samantha suggested they create a post on Good Fences, a social media site that connects users in the same neighborhood, or in this case, island. A long series of shares and comments eventually led Eddie to the Schultzes. I couldn't believe it, Mr. Schultz remarked. Talk about getting the extra, going the extra mile. The Schultzes had just placed the kayak in the water when it was swept out by a rip current on the eastern side of the island. It took less than a second, Mrs. Schultz remarked. They're really lucky it was the kayak and not us. Or we're really lucky. Good Lord. Reading out loud is... Mm. A rip current is a kind of extreme current that can take large objects and people out to sea with little warning. Areas in which these currents typically form are posted online by the town of Mallory Rock and should be avoided. Boom. There's a clue. So somewhere online, the town of Mallory Rock is going to tell us about riptides. 
However, tourists can be assured that apart from these specific areas, swimming in the waters around Mallory Rock is generally considered safe. Small items like a pair of sunglasses or a toy boat could easily float out on the tide during normal conditions, but larger object, objects like kayaks and thankfully swimmers have little or no risk of being carried off without the presence of a rip current. That too is going to become important for us to know. Um, so I just also want to point out now that Edward Gundy, who they're talking about in this article, the DJ, Eddie Blue, um, wound up on the town council um, after Beth's death. So now I don't know if Eddie Blue, I mean, he's a local DJ. I don't know. There's nothing suspicious about him, but I don't know how prestigious being on the town council is. I don't know. I don't know if there's a big vote coming up that we're going to find out about. I don't know if. I don't know what. I just know that Beth is no longer with us. And you'll see in a minute where I show you. Um, Eddie Blue has now been appointed. And it says in her place. So we know that he was the replacement to her. So I just think that that's another interesting thing that we need to take a look at. Um. This is also, let me go back to this. This is also sort of curious. Um, Hendricks Group. I have to assume that that's Martin Hendricks and probably Joey. Um, it seems like it's, it's a small island. It seems like they're developers and they do construction. So it almost seems like Possibly, are they direct competition to our buddy Jordan Woodard? Like, is that is that a thing? Or is Jordan Wood Woodard more of a buy, flip, and sell while these people do new construction? So maybe that's something that we're going to have to find out about later. Um, While we're here and we're talking about the Navigators Club, we were given this notebook. And most of the pages of the notebook are just like this right here. They are just for taking notes, for writing in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it even tells us that the sale of this notebook goes to helping the Navigators Club... Um, blow it up a little bit the sale of this notebook goes to helping the navigators club uh contribute to charities uh including the mallory rock historic preservation fund junior navigators the mallory rock lighthouse festival and the core cora reaver memorial scholarship so and then it just talks about the voyage to get here a little bit of history about the lighthouse a little bit about fishing. There was something here that struck me as being odd. Not really odd. I think it's going to be important later because of the emphasis that they seem to place on it. And that is the ferry. Known to Islanders as Old Ishmael, the Mallory Rock Ferry has been in operation since 1928. This plain but sturdy vessel is a familiar sight to most locals who take the ferry occasionally to work or pleasure. Helmed by longtime pilot Benny Howard, the ship is the only way for mainlanders to get on or off Mallory Rock, as no bridge to the island currently exists. However, the ferry's timing is known to be impeccable. As islanders are fond of saying, old Ishmael tells the sun when to rise. And I just think it's interesting that they made note of how on time the ferry is, how, how it's well known that the ferry is always pulling in or leaving when it's supposed to. And I just feel like that's something that's going to come back later um, and be important. So I just want to make a note of that. Um, and then the last thing on this, and we're back to talking about the Navigators Club. The Navigators Club is a social and charitable group whose members include the male descendants of founder Ed Green Mallory's original crew. 
The Navigators Club works to make the community a better place through funding charitable activities and fostering community. The club upholds a system of values and standards for living called the precepts. These 12 commandments were posted in Edgar Mallory's study in Latin, a language navigators still use today. Um, I was in the Navy for four years. And I will tell you that nothing... was posted in Latin anywhere on the bridge, um, including where the quartermasters were plotting courses. So maybe Latin is used by maritime navigators, but not used in the Navy. Members pledge to follow these commandments, especially in, in tempore tribulant, or times of trouble. A navigators club meeting will often conclude with members reciting the precepts together. And here are the precepts. And what I chose to do was use Google Translate to translate them from Latin. So let us, just for sake of playing, non ducor duco. I am not conducted. I am not guided. Um, I am not controlled. I am not going to read the Latin versions. You can see them. Fortune favors the confident. Acts not words. Either find a way or do it. Go to the stars through the rough. Every man is an architect of his own fortune. Um, so go to the stars through the rough. I feel like they're saying... Don't take the easy way. Achieve your goals by having to work for them, I believe is, is what that indicates to me. Um, if I cannot bend the gods, I will move Acheron. And I had to look, Acheron is a river in Greece. So if I can't bend the gods to my will, then I will move whatever the object is in my way on my own. Um... Caesar's end is the beginning of another. So Caesar, I guess, is saying when Caesar died, you know, when when somebody, when a leader dies or when somebody dies uh, or has gotten rid of or disappeared, not disappears in a uh, suspicious way, but leaves, whatever, their end is the beginning of, of another individual. Um a wolf is not afraid of a barking dog. Nothing comes out of nothing. That means if you don't, you're not going to get any results if you don't put in any effort. Is the way I took that. The eagle does not catch flies. That's interesting, and I don't know if the translation was wrong, but we're going to try to retranslate that. From being able to be, so from being able to climb a mountain to actually climbing the mountain, from being able to rebuild an engine to rebuilding the engine. I take that as how that means. Let's uh let's take this. Let's copy it. Let's go into Google Translate. It's already set from Latin to English. The eagle does not capture flies. So I guess what that is meaning is if you're an eagle, you are a predator you are up at the top of almost up at the top of the ecosystem like the the eagle eats a lot more things than things eat the eagle i guess is what it's saying and, and i am not a zoologist or anything like that so please don't come at me and say no there are eighty-five thousand other things that eat eagles but i think it's saying that the eagle is majestic it's up on top, and it doesn't play with things beneath it. It doesn't. It doesn't go after small fish. The eagle eats larger, larger creatures. The eagle doesn't stoop to scraps, if if that makes sense. I mean, that's that's me just sort of trying to guess at what that might mean. Um, the thing here 
that interests me is in times of trouble. So is this a situation where everybody involved in the Navigators Club in times of trouble would band together regardless of um, the situation? You know, that's just something curious to to pay attention to and to think about for for later purposes. Um, now we move on to the memorial program. And the memorial program is really just, just what it says. It gives us a little bit of a biography, and this is how on that front page I knew I knew about the daughter. I mean, other than there are references to it, but this is how I for sure knew about the daughter and about the husband, uh, about how she was an accountant and started her own accounting firm. Beth Ferris Hendricks was a blessing to all who knew her, a devoted wife, caring mother, and energetic leader. The impact she made during her short life will be remembered forever. Beth was born September 17, 1984, to Lee and Mona Ferris. She had a happy childhood on Mallory Rock, the island where her family had lived for 12 generations. A Mallory Rock High alumna, she is finally remembered for leading the Lady uh, Mariners soccer team to the state finals in 02. She was also awarded the Cora Reaver Memorial Scholarship and served as treasurer of the Spanish Club. After high school, Beth attended Acadian State University on the mainland, earning a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting. She later returned to Mallory Rock to marry her high school sweetheart and love of her life, Joey Hendricks, and start her own accounting firm, Ferris Hendricks. In addition to her professional endeavors, Beth was elected to the Mallory Rock Town Council, through which she actively sought to better the lives of, to better the lives of everyone on the island. To her fellow counselors, it seemed there was no problem too big for Beth's optimism and vision. Even with all her accomplishments, Beth, Beth's primary source of joy was her family, especially her daughter, Ruby. Beth is preceded in death by her father, Lee. She is survived by her mother, Mona, husband, Joey, daughter, Ruby, and sister, Gwen. The family asks that, in lieu of flowers, donations be made to the Cora River Memorial Scholarship Fund. And then we see that there, here is the, um, the service. God only knows Gladys Good Piano. Um, this is one of the songs on the playlist. And I can't play the playlist because YouTube will copyright strike, I believe, anything. But God Only Knows on the playlist is a Beach Boys song. Um, I think it's interesting. That. Josiah Hendricks. I don't know who that is unless that's Joey's real name. I guess it is because we have a video of that. Um, I think it's interesting that. Uh, Gwen didn't participate in any way, didn't speak, didn't give a reading, didn't do anything um, at the funeral. Um, so I just realized this is, I mean, when I started talking about this being a Beach Boys song, this is the second time that this song shows up. So I'm just wondering if I need to go re-listen to the song Um not that the song was written, but there may be something in the song that indicates something. Um, I've heard the song before. I don't know the words. So part of the song could be, my husband killed me, or I don't know. But there could be a message in it somehow. Not that the Beach Boys recorded that, but that could be what the lyrics are actually about. Who knows? Um, then I'll need to look and see if Turn to Life Again. Well, we will look. Turn to Life Again. Actually, not we'll look. You know what? Let's... Let's go to the playlist. So Godly Knows. 
What's from the Beach Boys? Harvest Moon is a good song. I like that song. No, it doesn't look like anything else. No, nothing else on this list is a pop song. Um, and then we get to this. And this is our first that we know of code. And I looked at it. And it looks like there are two codes. I'm going to say that this And now that I'm rethinking it, the V could be version. So this may be telling us, oops, didn't mean to do that. This may be telling us what version of the Bible to use. I, so let's back up. This is a book cipher. And I sort of knew it was a book cipher because we already know what book it is. Like we're looking at, a notation coming from a book. And in a normal book cipher, um, so a normal book cipher, you would have something like You would have something like this, and you would know what book it was. Let's say it was Harry Potter. Both people, the person writing the cipher and the person reading the cipher, would both have to have the same version of Harry Potter, the same print. Um, one couldn't use a hardback, and one couldn't use a paperback. Uh, each version of a book that's made... has the potential for not having the same words, the same lines on the same page. So the way this works is this would be page 134. Then we would count down 25 lines. And then on the 25th line, we would go over 14 words. So depending on the version is going to depend, it's going to affect the font size. So a hardback Harry Potter book probably has more words on a page than a paperback Harry Potter book. So that's how it would throw off the cipher. So in in a perfect world, everybody has the original very first, like the day the very first Harry Potter book went on sale, everybody ran out to the bookstore and bought that. So everybody's version Harry Potter book is the exact same. So everybody would be able to go to page 134, line 25, word 14, and that word would be the first word in the code. Then they would go to page 27, line 3, word 8. And that word would be the second word in the code. And so you would form a sentence by picking words out of a book. And I think they did this in National Treasure. And I think they did this in the Dan Brown, the uh, where Tom Hanks... Um, uh, da Vinci Code... Um, and those books where uh, Tom Hanks played Robert Langdon. And now there's a series on Peacock or something about a younger Robert Langdon. Um, but anyhow, so that's how a book cipher works. And so as soon as I saw this, I'm like, that could be a book cipher because we know the book. We know that we know how to get to a specific line. Genesis chapter 24, verse 42 and what, and it literally, I was like, and what if number one is the word in that line? The problem is there are literally hundreds of versions of the Bible in the world. And believe it or not, depending on what version of the Bible you read, the phrasing of the verses changes. So luckily for us, 
Um, we'll get rid of that. Luckily for us, they gave us a Bible verse thing. Ah, New Revised Standard Version. I just caught this. I didn't catch that before. New Revised Standard Version. This is telling us exactly which version of the Bible to go to. Um, and so I'll go through the solution because it, there's only seven words. And we will... Um, We will do this together because I actually like book ciphers. I think they're pretty cool. So Genesis 2442 and Genesis 1821. Word one is I. Word two is must. So going back to, and just in case you're not clear, this is the first cipher. Number one, because even, even Gwen told us that something's not right. These don't add up. So this has to be something other than what it is. And here we're looking at number one, two, three, four, five, and seven. There's no number six, which also leads me to believe that it's very specific like this for a reason. <coughs> so, Psalm 17.3 and Luke 6.27. Try. Is it 27? We'll see. Two. So the next two words in our code are try to. Mark 1125. And that's actually really funny because my name is Mark and my birthday is on 1125. So that made me chuckle. 1125 and Ruth 1-6. One, two, three, four, five. Forgive. And then Ruth one six. And don't forget, we skipped number six. So now we need to go to the seventh word. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Her. So let's put that into our cipher. And Pastor, what's his name? Reeves? Reaver? What is his name? Pastor Reaver. Pastor Reaver writes in code, I must try to forgive her. Hmm. So, he's married, so does he need to forgive his wife? Does he need to forgive Beth because he thinks that she killed herself? Um, does he need to forgive Jody Hendricks because he knows that she knocked off Beth? Does he need to forgive Gwen because whatever? We don't know. All we know is that our boy needs to forgive somebody. And we don't know why, but we're going to save this. Um, and then another thing they gave that's really cool is this map of the island. 
And so just for the sake of the investigation, let's look at making this a little bit smaller. Okay. Actually, can we go to maybe... All right. So North Beach is where Beth was found. And North Beach is right here. Ballantine's Bluff is where the police say she went in. And Ballantine's Bluff is right here. Um And so that's important to note. There are a couple of other things in our investigation that are going to be important to note, but we will get to those in due time. So then I started reading the last real piece of... Um, anything that we were given. And this is just the tourist tips. Uh, the lighthouse. I tried to put up the lighthouse into Google Images uh, because the cool thing about lighthouses is every registered lighthouse has a different paint job on it. And I believe it has to do with sailors being able to look when they see a, white, a lighthouse and know exactly what coast or what city or what town, I guess back then, town they were off the coast of or close to. Um, so I tried to put this lighthouse into Google image search and it came up, the result came up Portland, Maine, but that lighthouse didn't look, it looked the same. It was all white, but the top didn't quite look the same. So I don't know. I gave up the search. I, I thought if I really found out where that lighthouse, where this lighthouse was, it might ruin it for me. So I just quit after that. Anyhow, so this just gives uh, a little history of like places to visit, restaurants to go to. Uh, Sam Gundy, who's also on the town council, is a yoga yoga instructor and holistic medicine person. Uh, Once again, the ferry. Um, and it occurred to me, and I, I guess all this didn't happen quite in this order, but this is also important, reading through the clues. True to its name, the vanishing beach disappears when the tides come in. Tucked in between Stony Point and the ruins of founder Edgar Mallory's cottage, this remote spot is popular with locals for, for proposals, special events, or simply quiet contemplation. Um... And so the quiet contemplation thing had me thinking, we know that Beth was struggling. So is that where she went when she was needed to get out of her head or, or think about stuff or whatever? So that just bears a mention. Um, so once again... Um, 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 what do I need? I need this. So Mallory Cottage is 25. That's right there. Stony Point is 26. That's right there. So this area in here is Vanishing Beach, just because we're looking at the map. Um, in this area up here... 14 right there is the Navigators Club. That's the Sailors Memorial Park. Um, I looked at a couple things down here. Just curious. This is where the lighthouse is and the landing point. Um, so I looked at I looked at the map a little bit to see what was where. So then we get to in our investigation. the Mallory Rock website. And I knew there would be a website because they kept referring to it. And the link to the website is in, I'm gonna close that one. 
MR site, Mallory Rock site. It's in our dashboard. So on the website, you know, welcome to the official website for the town of Mallory Rock. And here it shows a pretty picturesque, picturesque town. Um, Amandine Noga, town manager. Thanks for visiting. The town council. So Amandine Noga, she's the town manager since 2018. When she's not working at the town hall, she's busy, busy men mentoring the next generation of Islanders at Mallory Rock High School. She's the English teacher. Uh, Jennifer Sirocco, town clerk, she moved to the island 12 years ago to open Mallory Rock Urgent Care with her business partner, Dr. Eric Kovacs. She quickly fell in love with the town's historic charm, and before long, she knew she was here for the long haul. Okay. Chris Ballantyne, once again, last name, founding member. He's the harbor master. Chris comes from a long line of fishermen and is honored to serve the hardworking folks in the fishing industry. In his spare time, he enjoys watching Acadian State University basketball and serving as a mentor in the Junior Navigators After School program. Martin Hendricks, our father-in-law. Martin Hendricks is the CEO of the Hendricks Group, a local development and construction company. He has been married to the beautiful Jody Hendricks for over 40 years. So this is our father-in-law. Edward Eddie Blue Gundy, counselor. Eddie is the newest member of the town council, filling the seat left by the beloved Beth Ferris Hendricks. He hopes to use this opportunity to be a progressive advocate for the people of Mallory Rock. So this is Eddie who suddenly found himself in the town council when Beth died. I don't know if that's a thing or not, but Stefan Ballantyne, counselor. So city counselor, that's not like a guidance counselor. Um, Stefan is proud to serve on the town council alongside his younger brother, Chris. Hailing from one of the oldest families in Mallory Rock, he pledges to continue the Ballantyne's legacy of service on the island. Stefan is the owner of the Oyster Bucket in downtown Mallory Rock. And the Oyster Bucket is, um, we've seen a couple of ads. One was in, I think, on the back of the lantern. And the other ad was um, on the tourist tips brochure. Allie Bates Good. Allie is an attorney with Journey and Ferris. Now, Journey and Ferris, um, I don't know if that's Beth and Gwen's dad that started this law firm. We know that Beth was an accountant, started her own accounting firm. And we know that Gwen owns a hotel. So I don't know who this Ferris is. Um, but specializing in estate and probate law, her husband, Kevin Good, is the football coach at Mallory Rock High. Together they have three sons, Rob, Silas, and Tom with an H. Sam Gundy. She's the secretary. She doesn't get a vote. She is the daughter of our DJ. She was on the beach with our DJ when they found the kayak. Sam is the owner of the Holistic Wellness Shop, Mother Island, and the daughter of Counselor Eddie Blue Gundy. She is proud to be the 12th Gundy to serve on the town council in some capacity. And then in memoriam, Beth Ferris Hendricks. Beth Ferris Hendricks' term as a member of the Mallory Rock Town Council was ended prematurely due to her tragic death. Taken from us far too soon, she will remain in our hearts forever. So this is our town council. The Mariner's Lodge Hotel. So this is the hotel that Gwen owns. Proprietor of the Mariner's Lodge Hotel, Gwen Ferris is offering a 30% discount on all stays during the offseason. And this just gives a little bit of a history. Two years ago, this is interesting. This, I think, is could be important. Ms. Ferris, with the assistance of local developer Martin Hendricks, renovated the property, reopening it for business. So it appears that Martin may be our partner. And maybe that's why he was concerned about the pool pump. So that's really the only important thing in this. Um, I mean, it's... It's sort of what you'd expect in a tiny resort community hotel. Um, so then, safety. And this is extremely important. Here's our boy Sullivan. Sully. Never swim alone. Always have a buddy, especially if no lifeguard is present. And these are, it tells us to watch out for riptides. Um, stay hydrated. Wear sunscreen. Wear life jackets. Never leave personal items unattended. Use caution when diving. Um, and this. 
this is the four spots they don't want you to swim in on the beach because of riptides. North, don't want to swim there. West side of the island, you don't want to swim there. East side of the island, you don't want to swim there or there. Oh, wait a minute. Where is that? Hmm. That looks like there's a riptide at Vanishing Beach. Remember what we were told. A riptide will pull a kayak, a body out to sea. But if it's not a riptide, then something that's human size or kayak size, if you put it in the water, it'll pretty much just stay there floating. So this tells us that there are only four places on the island that a riptide is going to pull you out to sea if your boat or human size. So that's important to note. And then the What's New tab. Oh, Cora Reaver Memorial Scholarship. Um, Eve, she's going to study digital communications. Good for her. Middle school science fair. And then I, I was gonna, I was gonna skip over this. And then I saw here, and I'm like, oh, okay, what is this? What do they want me to click on? And so sixth graders, Anna Sirocco, Simon Whitaker, and Devin Snow swept the categories, including best overall project at the annual Edgar Mallory Middle School Science Fair. Anna, Simon, and Devin, uh, they tracked the currents on Mallory Rock through messages in bottles. Hmm, okay. And so this pulled up the tracking currents on Mallory Rock through messages in bottles. This project was the brainchild of me, Anna Sirocco. I designed the experiment, purchased the bottles, and retrieved them after landing. My teammates, Simon and Devin, drank all the soda from the bottles so that we could use them. We divided Mallory Rock into sections to track our launching and landing sites, so they made a grid. Uh... At the end of the experiment, 38% of the bottles were recovered and 62% were lost or landed someplace that she couldn't get them back. So there are 550 whatever. And then this tells us how the experiment worked. So I am going to, I, uh, I made a map. This is a blow up or the printed printable version that I just scanned. And this is the map that we just saw. Um, I scanned it and I cut off the top. I just realized the numbers. So you're going to have to trust me on the work here. Um, and so these pink numbers are the bottles she could not get back. These blue numbers are the bottles they put in the water that did get back. And these are the landing spots of those blue numbers. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So nine bottles out of the 24 that she put in the water returned and they returned to five places. So to not be too confusing, I did a lot of things. At first I thought I was gonna have to track even the bottles that disappeared. And then I realized that I that they disappeared. We don't know what happened to them. So keeping track of them probably isn't important because we don't know if they sank, if if a seagull ate them, if they got caught in a rock, if they had a hole in them and filled with water. We don't know what happened to them. So I decided that wasn't going to tell us anything. So all of the dots that have lines correspond to all of the bottles that she did track. And as you see, tracking the currents and where things go... Um, we got to 20C, which is North Beach, which is right here. And then I circled the three bottles that wound up at 20C. This one, this one, and this one. And what we know from looking at the safety map is there's a circle on Vanishing Beach. What we know from that is that there's also a riptide on Vanishing Beach. And it's the only riptide that matches with 
where the bottle got dragged out to sea. It's the only riptide or it's the only riptide or the only tide that could have possibly pulled our body out to sea. These other riptides, the bottles that were put in the water, didn't go to North Beach. This was the only riptide that pulled the body to North Beach. And don't forget, even though on our chart, it shows three body, three bottles wound up on North Beach, we know that it has to be a riptide in order for the current to be strong enough to pull a body out. Which means that Vanishing Beach, and we also know that they wanted us to name a location. So the location had to have a name. And that's that's outside the game. That's sort of a, a cheaty way to double check and know that we were right. I knew without a doubt when I saw the tide chart, the bottle chart, and the safety chart. I knew without a doubt that Vanishing Beach was the location um, where Beth's body went into the water. Um So to put it in once again, Vanishing Beach, we're talking about right here. So we know for a fact that Beth went into the water. Don't know if this is where she died, but we know based on all the information that we have that this is where Beth went into the water. And wound up floating around to North Beach. The um, I wanted to show, just briefly show, these two items that were in the box. These also came in the box. Uh, and we know that the marker is just a marker. And the coaster was found on Beth's desk. And right now, I'm, I'm assuming that she sent it to us just so we had some sort of a connection to Beth and her love for the island and the lighthouse. So I, I'm assuming that these are not important items for us to talk about. So now we move on to what, what we have here is a situation where it seems to me that I have three uh, somebody in the Navigators Club somebody in the Hendrix family or Edward Gundy the um, DJ that took our spot on the city council. I don't know that being on the town council is enough to murder somebody yet, but we're only just beginning this investigation. So it could be true that we're going to find out that there was a reason based on the town council. Um, oh, I forgot to show something. So at first I thought, okay, Joey is the guilty party. And... You know, the husband did it, or one of the guilty parties, or what have you. Um, turns out we have this funeral footage. And so I'm going to play it because I feel like this is Joey. This is her husband. I feel like maybe he was sincere in this, but listen and see. Oops. You all know me. I'm Joey, Beth's husband. Uh, first, I just want to say how grateful I am that you all showed up to honor Beth. She was loved by a lot of people. And I think everyone being here is a testament to that. So thank you. Also, Mom and Dad, thank you for speaking about Beth. She loved you both very much. <sighs> wow. Oh, I am. Um, I have some notes, but it's it's kind of hard to find a place to start. Now, I've been in love with Beth since I was 14 years old. 
our parents knew each other growing up, but we didn't really talk until, well, one of my buddies dared me to go up to her in the cafeteria. Jake Good, I'm, I'm sure you all know him. Uh, it's freshman year and I'm walking up to her and I'm thinking, oh, she's amazing. And I'm like this like total main brain poser. And she's way too good for me, way too good. You know, I, I, I still think that it, I know that, actually. So anyway, I, um, our whole life together passed like it was two seconds. And now we're all here, which is crazy. It's just crazy. I mean, you're supposed to talk about all the great things a person did, but I don't think I have to remind anyone here how incredible Beth was because her actions speak for themselves. Like if, like if anyone called, no matter how big or small the problem, no matter what, she was there. She'd get on the phone or, or in the car and off she went to save the day. Sometimes she'd be running around so much when she got home, I'd ask, uh, hey, have we met? <laughs> what I mean is, Beth really cared. She made the place better and she did it for the people in her life. Her sister Gwen, our beautiful daughter Ruby, mother Mona, my parents, Martin and Jody, this island, and me. Even when I let her down. <sighs> You know, I've been thinking a lot about what I wanted to tell Beth if I could see her one more time. And I think I just want to say that I'm sorry. For everything. And thank you for being a wonderful wife, a mother, in person. And I'm just so sorry. I, uh, I think that's all I have to say. Just uh, thank you. I really appreciate you all being here. So I watched that, and I'm not sure that I really, 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 like, I feel like he was genuine with that. And when he sang, I'm sorry, I don't think that was about killing her. I think it was about the marital problems they were having. And maybe they had a fight that day and she was out on the beach pondering whatever and when this happened. But I, I felt like his eulogy up there was genuine. I mean, he could be a psychopath, and that could have been an act. Uh, clearly, it was an act. It was an actor. He did a good job portraying sympathy. So clearly, it is possible to pretend like you're sorry. But in the world of this investigation, I almost feel like he was genuinely sorry. Um, and he was honest and genuine about what he was saying. So, Navigators Club... Secret Society, I just think that they're fishy. Um, could Jody have... So, the police report said that the body had, you know, a, a big head wound and then other minor injuries. Uh, could they be from dragging? At first, I was like, well, a man had to do it because 
if she wasn't killed right there on the spot, they had to carry her body to a place. Um, but if a woman did it, could being dragged to that place have caused the injuries? We don't know. It's just purely speculation. Um, you know, like I said, maybe the, I felt like Jody was covering for her son, Joey, but then I watched the video and I'm not, Joey's still on the list, but I'm not as committed to Joey being a person of interest as I was when I started this investigation. You know, we need to find out who must the minister forgive because he clearly needs to forgive a female. Does he, does he need to forgive his wife for cheating on him? And that was on his mind. He wrote that code. We don't know. We don't know. Um, you know, she was an accountant. Did she catch one of her clients? We don't know who her clients are. Um, but let's assume that her accounting firm, A, let's assume that maybe it was on the island. And if that's the case, did she do the accounting for most of the businesses? Did she catch a mistake? Or even if it's not on the island because of the close-knit community, was she still the accountant to most of the businesses, to Jordan uh, Woodard, to uh, Martin Hendricks, to whoever else? So these are all things that are up in the air. Anyhow, once we came up with the, the spot where Beth went in the water, I had to email Gwen. And I emailed her and I told her what I said. And she, she emailed me back and was like, oh, my God, I knew you could do it. That makes perfect sense. She's like, I'm going to take this to police, the, the police. Now they have to believe me and reopen the investigation. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that's going to happen. They're going to tell her that it's circumstantial or there could have been another reason that the body washed up there or we don't know how the tides on every foot of the island respond or something. They're going to have some crazy, my guess is, some crazy excuse for why the body could have washed up there. But I think that's going to conclude this part of the investigation for now. Um, because I started this investigation late, I had the opportunity to not have to wait a month for the next bit of information. So I um, am being sent early the next package of clues and evidence to continue the investigation. So hopefully in the next week or so, we will be able to continue and move forward in this investigation. Anyhow, thank you very much for watching.